Columbia has a really important mission, and that's to protect the superb biodiversity and cultural diversity of one of the most beautiful countries in the world so that its people and nature can continue to thrive. And NatCap's role in this partnership is to collaborate with you all in this mission with our science and our experience from around the world that we'll share some of which today, but mostly to harness Columbia's expertise and deep knowledge of your country. So a little bit of nuts and bolts before we get started. This webinar will be presented mostly in English with Spanish interpretation available. And our Spanish interpreter is Thais Carolyn Pardo. And in order to enable the interpretation, you can um, activate the option by clicking on the globe at the bottom of your Zoom screen. It's highlighted here in a little red box. And if you click on interpretation and then select the language you'd like to hear, either Spanish or English. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat, the little chat window down at the bottom of your screen and we can help you. So the Natural Capital Project or NatCap is a collaborative initiative working to pioneer science, technology and partnerships that highlight the values of natural capital and environmental services in a broad range of planning and development decisions. And our goal is the same as Columbia's and that's to enable people in nature to thrive together. And the partnership is centered at Stanford University but it includes five additional core partners shown here and we'll hear from two others of them, uh, the University of Minnesota in Steve Pulaski and the Chinese Academy of Sciences represented by Professor Ouyang. So our agenda today has two main parts. Um, we'll be um, introduced and get done, have some stage setting from uh, Santiago Aparicio Velasquez, and then there'll be two main panels. A first one um, on GEP, the concept, the gross ecosystem product, and some of its applications around the world. And then we'll have a panel led by leaders and experts from Colombia talking about work that's already been done in this arena of applying natural capital accounts and developing ideas of how to incorporate natural capital and biodiversity in policy and finance and talk about opportunities for how we can advance this work further. And then we'll have some closing uh, time for Q&A, question and answers, and some closing remarks from Santiago and then Dr. Lisa Mandel, who's a lead scientist at NatCap. And we're just letting you know that a recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel, and we will share a copy of these slides in a PDF um, a few days after this uh, this workshop. And one more just little nuts and bolts um, note is that any questions, and we encourage your questions or comments, please enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And I and uh, um, Ale and others will field those questions, we'll bundle them together, and the speakers will answer them as we go throughout the workshop. This will help us keep an active dialogue going since we can't be together. And then if you have any logistics or technical questions, please just use the chat and we can help you there. Okay, so just to kick us off then, this as many of you probably know is the Gulf of Morosquillo. And people in many countries, including Colombia, understand intuitively the diverse benefits that nature brings to them personally and to their societies. But it's another matter altogether to specify where, how much, and for whom nature's benefits flow to people. And the values of a special place like the Gulf of Morosquillo are many. Mangroves and coral reefs and other key ecosystems provide fishery, coastal protection, 
climate and tourism benefits. Plus water filtration benefits come from upland forests in the Patamillo Park, delivering clean water into the Sinu River. And NatCap and DNP have worked together to support municipalities in an initial stage of just mapping and quantifying the benefits of these strategic ecosystems. So laying out a path towards a more sustainable prosperity for the region through the territorial pact of the Gulf of Montesquieu that those leaders are working through. So at NATCAP, we're just thrilled to work closely with superb leaders like Santiago and others in this workshop to be sure that the values of ecosystems people care most about are quantified in terms that can transform decisions. So we look forward to working with other institutions in the country to make GEP happen, including academia and government and multilateral development banks and NGOs. So we view this workshop as the beginning of a journey together and that we're really excited to help Colombia become a leader in developing and applying environmental accounts, which is what we'll be talking about now. So just to remind us all that the purpose of this training is to share the history of the development of the gross ecosystem product and put it in context with other natural capital accounting metrics so we can support Colombia in being an early example and inspiration for how this accounting can drive impact. So the GEP applications throughout China are, will be presented today by the leaders of that effort from municipal, provincial to national scales. And lastly, we'll explore the potential for Colombia to adopt and adapt GEP. So my last slide is just to introduce the first set of speakers. So we'll next hear from Santiago Aparicio Velasquez, who is the director of the group in Department of National Planning that we're working with. And then we'll hear from Professor Ouyang Ziyun, who's the director of the Research Center for Eco-Environmental Services in the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and his colleague, Tong is here to help answer questions and add um, interpretation for us, color um, commentary on the policy applications. And then we, um, then Ale will uh, introduce the government and other experts from Colombia when her panel starts. So I'm now going to turn it over to Santiago and I'll stop sharing my slides. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, um, good morning and afternoon to, to all, depending where you are. I'm going to switch to Spanish so that I can be more fluent. Um, bueno, pues mu muchísimas gracias por, por la invitación. Muy Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, this uh, workshop is truly innovative and, and uh, relevant. Colombia is one of the countries, well, with the greatest biodiversity. We focus more than 10% of our biodiversity. Well, 1% uh, is on our terrestrial coverage and of that. And we know that natural capital is the greatest uh, wealth patrimony of our nation. But the biggest uh, challenge now is how to achieve or make this natural capital uh, be accounted for and that the costs and benefits that are generated uh, not only for its conservation but for its uh, leveraging and its use be you be uh, regarded from an economic perspective I uh, proposed to the team when we thought about uh, protecting this that it's hard uh, to protect what we don't uh, value uh, so what we have to do is uh, value this or appraise it uh, and start uh, estimating and measuring uh, in the country. Well, we've uh, worked, uh, we've endeavored to work hard on this uh, through the WAVES uh, project first, and then we attained the adoption of the main framework of environmental accounts, economic environmental accounts, the SKY, and 
It is important, however, to continue to directly incorporate uh, NETCAP throughout the national planning process. It's also very important that uh, that this uh, accounting effort be uh, not something abstract, but uh, it has to be reflected at a subnational and local level. So in this regards, we know that, uh, well, our reality is based on the macro and the micro, not the micro and the macro, sorry, vice versa, uh, not the macro to the micro. And we uh, used the Golfo of Morosquillo that uh, Mary showed a spectacular picture of, well, it's an ecosystem, uh, um, it's a marine coastal ecosystem, and and the uh, the more is the Paramo of San Torbal, which is a high mountainous region. And in this regards, what we uh, seek is is that these two ecosystems have to allow us to be able to uh, measure and estimate or praise ecosystem services that are rendered there and the nat cap that it houses, and see how we can. Uh, perhaps uh, have more rapprochement to the government uh, bodies and be able to uh, integrate these uh, net cap assets in their accounting mechanisms. So these are two isolated pilots, but we have to begin somewhere. So that's a very important uh, issue we're working on with support from Stanford University uh, as part and the IDB. So we are now in a learning phase from successful experiences in other countries uh, to be able to see what other countries have done and to be able to uh, move from the technical assessment or appraisal phase and then uh, have that, uh, execute that and make it useful for conservation and protection. And then there is a gap we have to close uh, from the technical part, as I said, uh, how we uh, are able to uh, account uh, the GEP and then use it. So it's this this uh, issue that we're working on right now or this uh, task. Now, it's not easy for us. It's very innovative, but we acknowledge that the first step is to have the metrics down as uh, part of our gross ecosystem product uh, uh, requires, and then uh, move from there. GP offers an interesting experience, undoubtedly, uh, and we are now asking ourselves in Colombia, how do we attain that? And it's just so new, uh, as new as, as when Bhutan began to explore its uh, index to be able to measure happiness, uh, which is not a, a low one. Uh, and many people think that's uh, ridiculous. Uh, when when you look at metrics, you start realizing that uh, it's very interesting and it's uh, valuable. It makes sense. But then you see that any innovative process requires resist or has resistance. And uh, this, I don't think, will be any different. And but what we require is much technical rigor to be able to uh, respond to that resistance. So I do applaud the effort that have has been made uh, in this uh, direction. And I do thank you for your technical rigor, uh, that of, of our stakeholders, which has made this possible. So to support this uh, task, uh, to be able to move from uh, estimating GP and being able to actually budget for that, uh, we're visibilizing or making that cap more visible. So in Colombia, we've been fostering our green growth. How are we able to, how we are able, or sorry, how are we able to one day be able to, by 2030, attain a point in time in Colombia where we're uh, truly uh, using our, our natural capital as a comparative advantage and continue to generate income to protect that, that creates uh, 
that uh, can help us prosper. So in our uh, fiscal indexes, we have uh, much is spent on fossil fuels and our income, well, uh, is, is not sustainable given the climate crisis that we are in and our fiscal income uh, from fossil fuel production has to have to be replaced through natural capital and harnessing that what we call uh, our bioeconomy. So to the extent that uh, this grows, uh, Colombia and the private sector uh, will acknowledge the value in natural capital and be able to visualize uh, a future for this and the use of GEP to be able to uh, harness this important asset. So, so we need to be able to strike a balance, especially for these complex times. Uh, so thank you so much on behalf of the National Planning Department in Colombia for this opportunity. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Santiago. Those were really, really interesting and inspiring remarks. There's a lot of opportunity and a lot to build on all that Colombia has already been leading, as you say. I'd like to introduce next Dr. Steve Pulaski from the University of Minnesota. Um, and he will give us an introduction to gross ecosystem product in, in its concept and the breadth of it. And as uh, Santiago has been saying, this is a nice, really broad framework that is very customizable. So we're looking forward to working together with you all in doing that. So Steve, you wanna share your slides? Okay, sure. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to, uh, to speak with you today. Um, I'm uh, very excited to uh, talk about uh, GEP and, uh, and, and hope this is useful um, in Colombia. So let me um, share my screen. Okay, and hopefully this is now showing up. If it's not, somebody please let me know. It looks great. Okay, wonderful. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, gross ecosystem product, GEP, and try to provide a bit of uh, brief history and some uh, relationship of GEP with other ongoing efforts. Um, you know, Santiago already mentioned uh, the WAVES program and uh, and there, and SIA. So there, there are a number of things that are going on, um, and so try to fit GEP into this um, into this context. So, why do we need a, a, a GEP? What's what's the role for it? We already know about GEP's more famous cousin, gross domestic product or GDP, and it provides a clear and easily understood signal of economic performance. It's uh, what in English we'd call a, a headline number. And, but we also know that GDP leaves out much of what is um, of value from nature, how nature contributes uh, to our well being. And without some type of measure of uh, ecological performance, we often leave out in economics and in finance and in business and government decisions, we, we leave out these values of nature. Um, and that's much to the detriment both of nature and ourselves. So what GEP is trying to do is to provide a clear and easily understood signal of the value of nature, what natural capital contributes to human well-being. Um, so to do for nature what, uh, and, and the values of nature, what GEP, excuse me, GDP does um, for the conventional economic measures. Th there has been widespread recognition of the need to move beyond GDP, to have more complete measures 
of, of ecological, economic, uh, and social systems that support human well being. This book cover is uh, something that was um, commissioned by the French government now about 10 years ago uh, with two. Nobel laureates in economics, Joseph Stiglitz and Marcus Sen, uh, helping to lead the effort um, and pointing out that for sustainability, uh, we need to move further. We need to actually incorporate the value of natural capital. There's been an important opportunity in China to do this, to move further, move beyond GDP. And this is, uh, you know, so China is, is, is an important country in this respect. It's conventionally measured economic growth has been the fastest in the world, uh, but it also has over, over the last few decades experienced significant declines in its natural capital, um, water and air pollution being examples. There is recognition from the very top that it is important to deal with, to maintain natural capital. President Xi Jinping has, has said, clear waters and green mountains are as valuable as gold and silver. And China has pursued what it calls the, the, the China dream to become the ecological civilization of the 21st century. So there's a move within China that, uh, that something like GEP is every bit as important as GDP. So within China, there is um, the aim of, of developing these, this uh, GEP accounting, um, and it has a number of potential roles that it can play. It will reveal the contribution of ecosystems and nature to the economy and human well being show the ecological connection among regions, provide a basis for compensation from those who benefit from uh, ecosystem services to those who uh, supply the ecosystem services and serve as a performance metric for uh, government officials. So the hope here is that GEP will be reported alongside GDP and to be every bit as important. So what is the relationship between GDP and GEP? So GDP measures the, the value of goods and services that flow in an economy. And this includes many things that have very little to do with nature and things which really are ecosystem services. So uh, things like uh, timber or commercially caught fish, those will be currently measured in GDP. But many other things that nature provides are not measured in GDP, what economists would call the non-market ecosystem services. So the value of clean air, the value of clean water, of providing habitat for biodiversity. These are things that lie outside of conventionally measured economic accounts, but for which are captured in GEP. So there is some overlap between GEP and GDP, but GEP captures or tries to capture the complete value of what nature provides to the economy and to human well-being. So I, I want to make um, one more note before talking about related efforts. So GEP along with GDP is a measure of current income. But there is also an important measure of wealth or of the, of the, the value of the assets that a society has. So along with a measure like GEP, it is also important to have a measure of the stock of natural capital and to know whether that is increasing uh, or decreasing. And for sustainable development, that is important. Um, and in China, in addition to coming up with a measure of GEP, there are also efforts going on to assemble natural capital accounts. So let me spend a few minutes talking about the relationship between GEP and other efforts. 
So I'll talk about four. Uh, one is the system of environmental economic accounts, um, in, in particular, the ecosystem accounts, measures of inclusive wealth, and then uh, work both at the World Bank, the, uh, several different programs, and also work going on at the Inter-American Development Bank. So in terms of what is going on with the system of environmental economic accounts, and particularly the ecosystem accounts, um, many of you are probably aware that earlier this year, um, the ecosystem accounts were formally adopted as a statistical standard so that this is, it joins the, the family of measures that the UN um, uh, supports um, and expects countries to uh, provide. So that includes GDP, but now it will also include GEP. So GEP was included in um, this uh, formal announcement. Um, and you can see the, how they defined uh, GEP, which actually follows from uh, the, the way it was led by Professor Uyang uh, in China. There is effort within the economics profession to derive what is called inclusive wealth. So inclusive wealth is really a measure of the, of the assets, of the stocks. So it's not directly comparable to GEP, or the flow of benefits um, at a unit or a point in time. But inclusive wealth is meant to capture the aggregate value of all capital assets, human capital, manufactured capital, natural capital, and social capital, and report those in a common monetary metric. So this would be equivalent to having a set of wealth accounts that go along with the measures of income of GDP and GEP. It is important to note, however, that uh, there are very difficult um, technical issues and data issues with trying to measure the value of wealth. And so far, the efforts that have been done to date have mostly focused on uh, measures that are more easily um, put into dollar terms. So the value of natural resource assets, but much less has been done on the value of ecological assets. The World Bank is leading a number of different um, programs and projects related to this. So promoting the, um, trying to capture the value of ecosystem services and of natural capital. So they put out um, a series of, of reports every few years on the changing wealth of nations, which includes the value of natural capital. Uh, the next one is due in September of this year. They've also done wealth accounting, um, of which Colombia is a part, and uh, put out a report just at the beginning of this month called the Economic Case for Nature, which actually builds on the invest modeling and a computable general equilibrium model of GTAP. And then finally, there is the Inter-American Development Bank, which is also similarly, similarly doing reporting on integrating an economic model with environmental modeling and also using uh, some of the invest models. Um, there are many other reports going on. Let me just skip to the end, however, and say, this is a time where there is a great amount of rapid progress. Um, the importance of having measures like GEP is becoming clear uh, to many people. It is important as a, a way to correct the blind spots in standard economic accounting and provide better measures for what is truly valuable. So just as, GDP started because we were, we didn't have good uh, signals of what economic activity, how the economy was doing in the Great Depression. The great degradation of natural capital should uh, push us to develop similar measures of GEP and show the values of natural capital to the economy and to human well being. So with that, thank you very much. And just as a note, uh, the wonderful team of collaborators in China 
and, and outside of China. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Steve. That was a really great overview. And um, there's some already some good comments and questions in the Q&A um, based on Santiago's remarks um, and some good updates from Camilo. Um, so we'll keep that discussion going in the Q&A. Please feel free to enter your comments or questions for Steve or Santiago in the Q&A and we'll collect those as we go. And Steve and Santiago, you can feel free to comment in there too. Next, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Gretchen Daly, who is a co-founder of NatCap and a professor of biology at Stanford. So Gretchen, are you, you have the floor. Fantástico. Estimados y estimadas, buenos días. Fantastic. Uh, dear, uh, dear guests, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, can you all see me well? Uh, sorry. We're very, I'm sorry for covering the screen. Uh, we're truly happy for this opportunity to learn from you and work with you to be able to protect the environment in Colombia and to, uh, well, as uh, Dr. Santiago Aparicio says, uh, to open up uh, a pathway for sustainable, green sustainable development. We're truly grateful for the opportunity to participate and work together in such a pioneer effort and a necessary one as well, such as this one, as uh, Deep Lefke just mentioned. And we're truly committed in supporting uh, the global leadership of Colombia uh, with Santiago Aparicio and all of you in on this pathway to inclusive green development. Now I'm going to uh, well present my or make my presentation in English, but I just wanted to mention that I'm truly looking forward to working to, uh, with you in person in Colombia very soon. So let me just get my slides up uh, if you can just bear with me. Pueden ver este bien. Momentito. It's in it's in that presenter mode. Oh, there you go. Great. Thank you. So we heard a very clear and compelling explanations from both Santiago Aparicio and Steve Pulaski on um, both why and also on how we need to um, advance this pathway of development um, that's green and inclusive and how GEP can help us realize the values of natural capital and transform to this future by this trajectory by 2030. Steve really emphasizing the need for a clear and easily understood signal and metric for guiding investments and measuring performance. When it comes to how, I will just um, lay out a little bit more about the work that we've all been doing together over many years through the Natural Capital Project and um, related efforts to support this change that we're seeking now. First, co-developing science together with leaders in many arenas like yourselves to develop an actionable approach that is helpful in connecting with the amazing technology that we have now for sensing the values of nature and their change 
across the world and bringing that science and technology together in a useful way to inform decisions and drive investment in regeneration, in recovery from the pandemic, and in well being. This co development we do with leaders internationally, um, here just showing in Costa Rica, and with a large team from China led by the um, leaders, both in financial and planning departments in the central government. Also working with many other experts and many um, institutions, both research and technical, and also focused much more on policy, on business, on finance, in many, many different arenas. Together, we've co-developed a system called INVEST, this software system for making this science actionable and accessible and for revealing, like Mary Ruckelshaus said at the beginning, where and how much to protect and the values of nature for people under different scenarios and pathways of development. This integrated system is now being used in about, well, most countries, over 185 countries, and now, um, thanks to great efforts by Steve Pulaski, Mary Ruckelshaus, and many others on this international team, being adopted by networks of cities across the world. So we're seeing the application of this work in um, many regions, in Latin America and the Caribbean really stand out as opening up pathways for scaling and mainstreaming these values of natural capital. These pathways include scalable demonstrations in development planning, in the black diamonds, in sustainable, livable, healthy cities, in the green diamonds, and there are actually many, many more underway now. And then in particular sectors and places, there is a lot of focus on coastal climate resilience, on securing fresh water, and on advancing standards through the private sector for using a universal approach to measuring and reporting and accounting for natural capital in policy and finance. And this is all being supported crucially by the Inter-American Development Bank for scaling across Latin America and the Caribbean. They are showing Luis Alberto Moreno who really transformed the bank and in, launched and um, really drove compelling change during his tenure as president. And now looking at GEP, the idea is to use this co-developed approach of science, technology, data, and connecting across scales to field studies as well in order to account for natural capital using INVEST to value the goods and services from natural capital and calculate GEP for the three primary uses that Steve mentioned. Number one, illuminating the contribution of ecosystems to the economy and to society. Number two, informing compensation and financial investments to be made across regions and also across countries. 
And finally, evaluation of policies and these investments and tracking of progress through time. So this um, advance of GEP is being supported, the adoption of GEP being supported not only by the Inter-American Development Bank in Colombia and soon other parts of Latin America, but also by the Asian Development Bank, which supported development of GEP from the beginning and is promoting, uh, there are many countries actually, more than seven major Asian countries asking for support in deploying GEP. Since the UN approved of GEP as a global metric, the um, World Bank is also advancing um, this together with the global environment facility supporting all of it. And in a phase starting this, um, October, we will be working together with South Africa and development institutions across Africa to deploy GEP. But we're extremely fortunate now to support Colombia in any way we can in driving this transformation, in seizing the momentum behind scaling in guiding investments with the new data and science, in connecting policy, planning, finance, and practice, demonstrating um, compelling success in key sectors and places across the country, and finally, in scaling up and accelerating um, the recovery that we are all reaching for and regeneration. Thank you so much. And I look forward to hearing the discussion and working together um, as soon as possible in, in uh, person. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Gretchen. That was a, also a really great overview. I definitely encourage people to keep adding comments and questions in the Q&A. Um, I see that that's happening already, which is great. And um, we have one more presentation here um, before we'll take a little pause and have a discussion with the panelists from this session. And this is, these are some remarks from Professor Ouyang, who's the director of the um, Research Environmental Center in the Chinese Academy of Sciences that we introduced earlier. As Professor Tong said, Ouyang is very sorry not to be able to join us today, but he um, has recorded some remarks that we'll now share with you. And then Professor Tong is here to help us in the question and answer period about the amazing innovations that China is demonstrating in really practical applications of these natural capital accounts in GEP. It's really, really interesting to see all the work they've done. So Lori, will you be um, sharing that the presentation with us? Yes, I will. Just give me one moment, please. Thank you so much. Do you see the video? Uh, we just saw the, the front of it and now we're seeing your window screen. There it is.
Are you live? Is everybody able to hear it? No, we can't, Lori. We can see it. It was advancing, but we can't hear anything. Okay. I think it's because we have the interpretation on. Let's try okay. it one more time. And now it's on the like this third or fourth slide. Are you able to hear it now? I can't. I don't know about others. No. Oh, it's just getting it's getting louder. I think it was a volume problem. I think it's a volume problem. I think you got it there, Lori. It was just turned way down. I could hear Tong's beautiful voice, <laughs> a voice for radio. Is it still, Lori, are you still um, working on the volume? Yeah, it's it's funny, and now we can't hear it. I wonder if you try starting over, and um, I don't know what the fix is, but. Sorry about that. Let me try starting over. Yeah, it's okay. We'll 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 get it. Greetings, distinguished guests. I am from the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Now we have good volume and no no video, but that was good volume. We're going to get it. I'm very sorry about this, everyone. Yeah. It's okay. It's a challenge. You're doing great. Greetings, distinguished guests. You got it. Great, I am Lori. the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and I'm Thank very you. pleased to introduce you to Gross Ecosystem Product, or GEP. The content of my presentation will cover five dimensions shown here. To put it simply, I hope to answer the questions, what is GEP? How do we measure GEP? How do we apply GEP? First, allow me to describe why GEP has been proposed and its conceptual basis. In other words, what is GEP? A country, a region, or a city can be considered as a human natural system, which includes the subsystems of economy, society, and nature. Gross domestic product, or GDP, is widely used to assess the performance of economic systems, while the human development index is used to assess the state of social systems. However, we lack an indicator to assess the contributions of nature to human well being. Therefore, there is an urgent need to develop a way of measuring how nature benefits humanity. In order to advance the construction of ecological civilization in China, China's president, Xi Jinping, has proposed that lucid waters and lush mountains are worth their weight in gold and silver, and emphasized the significant value of nature for human development. Realizing this goal requires, one, incorporating ecological benefits into the government's assessment and evaluation system. Two, establishing an ecosystem services-based financial compensation system, or eco-compensation. And three, establishing a natural capital accounting system. In order, in order to account for the contributions of nature to humanity, we define GEP as the aggregate value of final ecosystem goods and services provided to people in a given area. Ecosystem assets are natural resources that provide ecosystem goods and services. 
including forests, grasslands, wetlands, marine ecosystems, human-managed ecosystems such as farmlands and urban parks. GEP and GDP are different indicators, but the two are also related. GDP covers mining, manufacturing, construction, transportation, communications, commerce, and finance, among other sectors. GEP primarily covers water retention, flood mitigation, soil retention, pollination, carbon sequestration, pollution filtration, and so on. However, some goods and services are included in the accounting of both GDP and GEP such as agricultural products, forestry products, ecotourism and leisure, and hydropower, among others. Now, let us move to GEP's accounting framework. GEP accounting guidelines mainly take into consideration the following five aspects. One, accounting for the monetary value of ecosystem goods and services in a specific location. Two, accounting for the use of ecosystem goods and services, including direct and indirect use value. Three, accounting for final ecosystem goods and services, including material goods, regulating services, and non-material services. Accounting first for the functional quantity of ecosystem goods and services, that is to say their biophysical value, and then determining the price of each ecosystem good or service, which together with the corresponding biophysical value provides the monetary value. The ecosystem goods and services indicators used in GEP accounting are shown here. Material goods include food, herbs for traditional Chinese medicine, water resources, nature-based energy sources, and raw material. Regulating services include water retention, carbon sequestration, pollination, water quality improvement, air quality improvement, soil retention, and flood mitigation. Non-material services, also known as cultural services, include recreation, ecotourism, and aesthetic experiences. In GEP accounting, the first step is to determine the list of ecosystem goods and services in the accounting area. Then, based on ecological and environmental monitoring and statistics from relevant sources, we can get the necessary data for GEP accounting. Next, we calculate the functional or biophysical quantities of ecosystem goods and services, and at the same time determine their associated prices. Finally, we calculate the account area's GEP, which is the sum of material goods value, EMV, regulating services value, ERV, and non-material services value, ECV. This table shows the specific methods used to calculate the functional quantity and monetary valuation of different ecosystem goods and services. For instance, food production values can be derived from available statistics and market prices. Pollination values come from pollination model calculations. Water retention values are based on hydrological monitor monitoring and water balance models. And ecotourism values can be calculated on the basis of tourist visits and the travel cost method. Now I will introduce how GEP accounting pilot demonstrations have been carried out in China. At present, GEP accounting has been carried out in at least four provinces, more than 10 cities and over 100 counties in China. Provinces include Qinghai, Guizhou, Inner Mongolia, and Hainan. Cities or prefectures include Shenzhen, Lishui, Fuzhou, Pu'er, Ganzhe, Tonghua, and Xing'an Banner. Counties include Deqing, Kaihua, and Xishui. In fact, every month there are new cities or counties that adopt GEP accounting. Here I introduce GEP accounting in Qinghai province. Qinghai is located in western China, on the eastern side of the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau. Qinghai is the headwaters of the Yellow, Yangtze, and Mekong rivers. It is known as East and Southeast Asia's water tower. Qinghai covers an area of 722,000 square kilometers and has a population of 5.8 million people. Grassland is the main ecosystem type, including alpine meadow, alpine steppe, and other grassland types. Qinghai is also a global biodiversity hotspot, home to many rare and endangered animals, such as Tibetan antelopes, snow leopards, wild yak, 
Bactrian camels, Asiatic wild ass, and black-necked cranes. This table shows the types, functions, and economic values of ecosystem goods and services in Qinghai. These include material services, water supply, flood mitigation, soil retention, non-point pollution prevention, water purification, air purification, sandstone prevention, carbon sequestration, ecotourism, among others. The value of water-related ecosystem services accounts for 58% of Qinghai's GDP. In 2015, Qinghai's GDP was 185.5 billion RMB. The value of material goods accounted for 64.6%. The value of regulating services accounted for 23.7%. And the value of cultural services accounted for 11.7% of the total. We further assessed different ecosystem goods and services contributed by different areas of Qinghai. For, for instance, the value of agricultural goods mainly came from Haibei and Haixi prefectures. The value of animal husbandry mainly came from Yushu prefecture. The value of water resources primarily came from Yushu, Guolo, and Haidong. And the value of carbon sequestration came mainly from Haidong, Haibei, Guolo, and so on. We also analyzed the other areas of China that benefit from Qinghai's ecosystem goods and services. We found that there were 16 provinces that benefited from Qinghai's water retention services, especially Ningxia, Shanxi, Henan, Shandong, and other provinces in the middle and lower reaches of the Yellow River. Additionally, more than 20 provinces and cities benefited from the ecotourism services offered by Qinghai. All provinces and urban regions in the Yangtze River Basin benefited from Qinghai's flood mitigation services. We also analyzed the changes in Qinghai's GDP from 2000 to 2015, finding that the value of material goods increased by 82.6%, the value of regulating services increased by 9.8%, and the value of non-material services, mainly ecotourism, increased by 408.8%. Now, let us move to the application of GDP accounting. This framework diagram shows the application of GEP to decision making. First, GEP accounting can be used to help meet policy and administrative goals. Second, GEP accounting can be used for land use and infrastructure planning, allowing us to evaluate how changes impact ecosystem goods and services. Third, GEP accounting can be used to formulate eco compensation policies, particularly in terms of determining reasonable payment amounts. Through these applications, we can promote ecological protection and restoration improve ecosystem assets, enhance the supply of ecosystem goods and services, and grow GEP, leading to a greater ability for nature to contribute to human well-being. In China, government departments have actively promoted the application of GEP research. For instance, the Chinese Academy of Sciences has supported the research and development of GEP accounting methods and demonstrations of application. The Ministry of Science and Technology, the Standardization Administration, and, and the Ministry of Ecology and Environment have supported the creation of technical standards for GEP accounting. The National Development and Reform Commission, or NDRC, and the Asian Development Bank have backed methodology to apply GEP accounting to the evaluation of, of provincial, municipal, and county-level eco-compensation policies. The Ministry of Ecology and Environment has also supported the organization of training for GEP accounting. Finally, local governments have supported the application of GEP accounting to evaluate the effectiveness of ecological protection and green development. The application of GEP accounting in China has five dimensions. First, it can be used to evaluate government and policy effectiveness, as has been the case with the, with the NDRC, the Ministry of Ecology and Environment, the provinces of Inner Mongolia, Guizhou, Qinghai, and Zhejiang, and cities such as Shenzhen, Shundu, and Tonghua, among others. Second, GEP accounting can be used to determine eco-compensation, as in Li Shui, Pur, and other cities. The amount of compensation payment is determined based on the level and associated changes of GEP. Third, it can be used to assess sustainable development, namely the coordinated development of nature and humanity, as reflected in the changes of and relationship between GEP and GDP. 
This has been the case for the large cities of Shenzhen and Zhuhai. Fourth, GEP accounting can be used for policy or corporate decision making, as demonstrated by Zhejiang province, the cities of Lishui and Fuzhou, and Ant Forest. Fifth, GEP accounting can be used to assess the contributions of nature or ecosystems to people, as in Qinghai province and Ganzhou prefecture, among other places. Now, let us move to the main findings and challenges of GEP accounting and application. The application of GEP accounting in China has yielded five main findings. First, GEP provides an intuitive way to convert ecosystem services into monetary value and to understand the value of nature's contribution to humanity. Second, GEP provides policymakers with a clear and convincing indicator of the value of ecosystem services. Third, GEP can be used to evaluate the effectiveness of government and policies in terms of conservation, land use, and infrastructure planning. Fourth, GEP can provide the basis for determining reasonable eco-compensation levels. Finally, as shown by GEP accounting in Shanghai and other parts of China, the data and methods already exist to enable GEP accounting to occur in different countries around the world. However, GEP accounting also faces several challenges. First, there are data limitations, for instance, Existing environmental monitoring systems were not designed to carry out ecosystem service assessment and, and accounting, so monitoring data cannot meet the needs of GEP accounting. Second, many quantitative methods and models of ecosystem services are not completely accurate and need further refinement. Third, many ecosystem services lack market prices, which means other valuation methods are acquired, which then mean that this may influence applicability. Fourth, Current accounting methods often make it difficult to distinguish the value-added contribution of nature from the value-added contribution of human input. Finally, in China's GEP accounting, ecosystem service indicators are not comprehensive, and there are many ecosystem services that have not yet been accounted for, such as the value of ecosystem-based oxygen provisioning in high-altitude environments, like the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau, health-related ecosystem services, and the full value of cultural services. To address the problems faced by GEP accounting, we have three recommendations. First, the standardization of GEP accounting methods should be promoted so that comparable results can be obtained for different regions and from different researchers. Second, environmental monitoring systems should be upgraded to provide stable data sources for GEP accounting. Third, Pilot projects for GEP accounting in different countries should promote development that is green and inclusive to improve applicability. The development of GEP accounting and its demonstration applications in China have been the products of international cooperation. Members of this collaborative team include those from the Research Center for Eco-Environmental Sciences of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, the Natural Capital Project, China's National Bureau of Statistics, and other experts from the United States, the United Kingdom, and local governments across China. Our research has received support from the Chinese Academy of Sciences, the Ministry of Science and Technology, the National Development and Reform Commission, the Ministry of Ecology and Environment, the Standardization Administration, and the Bureau of Statistics, as well as the support and collaboration with the Natural Capital Project, Asian Development Bank, United Nations System for Environmental Economic Accounting, and other partners. This is the conclusion of my presentation. Thank you. Okay, that was great. Thank you, Lori, for the technical help and Tong for the wonderful narration. So I'd like to, we have a few minutes to get a little bit of question and answer um, started now. I'd like the panelists, including Tong, to please turn your videos on. And I've got, um, there's some good questions in the, in the Q&A that I'll pose to each of you, um, um, just to get a little discussion going. Um, so first, um, Steve, um, there's a question from Neri Londonio, and um, they asked, does the calculation of GEP incorporate effective taxation? 
And do the analyses conducted in various economic sectors show the usage of natural resources and also include taxation rates? It's a great question. Um, the, the application uh, that Tong just talked about in, in Qinghai and uh, in other places in, in China, we focused on the, the total value of the ecosystem services and, and actually did not worry as much about um, the distribution of the benefits between taxes going to the public sector and what uh, went to businesses and households. However, um, if one knows the tax rates and you can apply them so that you can, you can track, in fact, the distribution of the benefits to various government entities, as well as to businesses and households. So the system is set up um, as like the um, system of environmental economic accounts to keep track of not only the total, but the distribution among different entities. So, so in principle, the answer is yes, we can incorporate taxes and the flow of benefits uh, to governments as well as what's kept in the, in the private sector. Um, the other part of the question on the, the use, um, yes, there um, we definitely track uh, who is it that benefits? So where is the service being provided? So in the figures that uh, Tong showed, um, we, we track, you know, if it's, for example, a water related service, who either in Qinghai or in a downstream province um, benefits from uh, that increased water supply or uh, more clean water supply so that we, we actually do know who is it that's um, using the resource and what, what benefits they, they get. Thank you, Steve, that's great. And thank you for the question. There's a question for Gretchen from anonymous attendee who's been very active in the Q&A. We appreciate your questions a lot. And they ask, how do we quantify the existing deterioration of ecosystems? the numbers of living planet, um, the WWF report are dramatic, and also those in the IPBS report. Um, it's very important to show the urgency of the change. And um, this person's wondering, how can we do that? How can we quantify the existing deterioration before we figure out how to move forward? Thank you so much for raising that question. Um, a really important one connecting to all of this. And there are basically um, two primary ways. One is through direct monitoring, like Professor Wu Tong was describing in the presentation together with Professor Ouyang. That involves um, technically trained researchers and others using sometimes technology, sometimes direct measurement of um, the cover and the quality of vegetation, such as mangroves or grasslands or tropical forest. It might also involve tracking change in the abundance and the types of birds or mammals or other biodiversity. Another way of measuring, uh, maybe I should say there are three ways. The second way is to look at the output in production systems and track change in production in, um, say, grassland ecosystems with grazing animals, in um, forestry systems, in fishing and um, the range of marine production systems. And then a third way is using technology. And this is getting a lot better, um, such as through satellite imagery or other remote sensing. And that involves connecting changes that can be detected by these different sensors to changes on the ground. 
or in the water. And that is also improving dramatically. So those are the primary approaches. And we have good enough data on many types of change to launch GEP accounting now. But like Professor Wu Tong emphasized, it would be helpful to launch more systematic monitoring of key ecosystem attributes and key benefits in order to best track the changes and best be able especially to understand where investments are leading to improvement. But thank you very much for raising this really good question. Great, thank you, Gretchen. And that's a really good segue. I wanna ask a question to Tong and then we'll finish with one question for Santiago and then we'll move to the panel. But there's an interesting question for you, Tong, which is from Natalie, Nat Natalia. Um, and she asks, how did you calculate the economic value of ecosystem services that do not have market values, such as cultural services? Um, and she and she and then Diego also asked a related question, which is what sources did you use for pricing the ecosystem services? So could you help address those questions from the attendees, Tong? Sure. Uh, thank you for that question. Those questions. Um, in terms of develop or arriving at prices for ecosystem services that don't have market prices, we used a variety of methods, many of which are um, have been commonly or frequently used in uh, environmental economics research. So in the presentation, um, well, one that was mentioned was, uh, or was displayed on the PowerPoint was the travel cost method. Um, in terms of the cultural services uh, or the non-material services, the one that we primarily focused on was ecotourism. And in China for GEP calculations, the method that was used and the data sources that were, were used for that were mostly uh, based on tourist visits. And the data for that uh, we got from official statistical accounts uh, because those are numbers that uh, tourism bureaus and uh, local governments keep track of. Um, again, it's not a, a perfect method to capture the, the full or the, the genuine value of the ecotourism service, but or the cultural service, but it's, uh, it's the one uh, in terms of our experiences where we have the most uh, reliable and consistent data. Thank you, Tong. And I, I, we're, we're running out of time on this one, but I just wanted to note that Santiago, there's a question from Yolanda Casayas, if you can do a quick one for her and then maybe continue in the Q&A. You've been doing a great job responding to questions in the Q&A. But she asks, we have evaluated ecosystem services from the environmental authorities, and we find it difficult to quantify the change of ecosystems in biophysical terms, and also find it challenging to choose the adequate method for economic valuation. So she wonders how we can access more information to do a better job on those questions. Okay. Gracias, Yolanda, por, por la pregunta. Pues es una pregunta bastante compleja que ameritaría una, yo creo que una sesión de trabajo, pero en términos generales. Um, Thank you for your excellent question. And I think that answering it well would require a whole other webinar. But uh, given the difficulties in, uh, well, answering your question, I think what we could do is go back to a specific case. We did this uh, it, with the Morosquillo Gulf uh, with our NatCap project uh, done with with uh, Stanford University and the Mi Paramo uh, project that we're working on with the Swiss uh, Development Corporation. So the idea is to analyze on a micro level how with these two systems, we've been uh, close to uh, resolving the complex topics in being able to quantify uh, these ecosystems. So I will uh, give you my email and respond to you more precisely. Okay, that was, there's a lot of good questions. We'll continue the discussion in the Q&A, but we'd like to move now. I'd like to introduce 
Dr. Ali Echeverri, who is a researcher and leading it with NatCap and is Colombian and is leading a lot of this work um, connecting Colombia um, to natural capital accounting and decision. So Ali, I will turn it over to you. Muchas gracias, Mary. Gracias a todos. Buenos Thank días. you, Mary. Thanks. Welcome to all of you. I'm Alejandra Echeverri. I'm a researcher here uh, at Stanford University, the NatCap project. And I am from, uh, I'm in Colombia right now, which is from, represents the Embaracha, uh, me, uh, mountain inhabitant community, uh, native community. It's a great pleasure to moderate the Colombian experts panel to hold a debate uh, regarding the future of uh, ecosystem accounting systems in Colombia uh, with regards to the gross ecosystem product. I'm going to present our panelists and remind them to speak slowly because we do have interpretation. Uh, so, so please, uh, when I ask, I give you the floor, Turn on your uh, videos. We have uh, Professor Diego Andres Covalida from the DANE, which is the Colombian Statistical Department, coordinator of alternative uh, concepts, satellite accounts. Uh, we have Byron Cubillos from UNDP Colombia, economist, and uh, has an MA in economics. We have Dr. Mara Cecilia Londoño, who is a researcher from the uh, biologic, the von Humboldt Biological uh, Research Institute, and then Professor Juan Carlos Mendieta from the National University of Colombia, the University and the University of Los Andes. Uh, welcome all of you. I'd like to begin with a question for uh, Professors Diego and Juan Carlos. What elements uh, uh, that have been presented in uh, methodologies for calculating the GEP applies in Colombia? And out of that, that applies Applies, what do you think is desirable? I'm going to uh, give you the floor, Gracias. Professor Diego. Thanks. Alejandra, good morning to all of you. First of all, I'd like to just thank you for inviting me to be a member of this important panel. It's truly a great experience to be part of the, this discussion. I'm Diego Cobaleda and I'm um, head of the satellite account for alternative uh, concepts at the National Statistics, Statistical Agency, sorry, DANA in Colombia. DANA is the government authority in charge of uh, developing uh, economic environmental accounts in Colombia. So we have moved forward here in implementing our environmental accounting system and uh, economic accounting system as the uh, as part of the central framework in sky so our uh, predecessors did mention that the methodology of our environmental uh, economic uh, or accounting system, sorry, environmental economic accounting system has started to be accounted for, and uh, formally that is. And now that it's official, we will uh, establish a guideline to uh, develop uh, a Colombian uh, GEP accounting system. So we've moved forward in this effort and we're in the process right now of of, of um, uh, moving forward in this. So it's very important, as was said, essential, we believe, to continue to uh, account for our ecosystems. We're doing that right now. Uh, but since the EEB, sorry, the GEP, uh, looks at ecosystem accounts as essential, we believe that an important element of our methodology is just to continue to do what we're doing. It's that simple, but import, uh, something important to note that Santiago also mentioned at the start of his presentation is how to appraise these accounts. 
So I reiterate, uh, so we're providing, uh, we're accounting for monetary and physical uh, information. And as Dr. Uh, Steven mentioned, we need to uh, appraise and assess uh, the ecosystem services that are provided. So that's the, the crooks, that's what we need to do. Uh, and before we start uh, to actually um, appraise or, or gather uh, our GEP, we have to set a price on this. And there is no doubt that um, we can't do this without technology. And even though information is limited, uh, technology uh, is also something that, that we need to uh, definitely incorporate as part of our uh, exercise to, uh, to make this estimate. Thank you, thank you, uh, Juan Carlos. Okay, to respond to the question, I just want to mention uh, something very important as background information, just for our international experts to kind of uh, get on the same page and understand that, well, Colombia is a pioneer uh, because it has an ecological constitution, actually. And that's really important because based on this premise, there's something very key, which is uh, that depreciation of NAT cap has uh, moved forward to the extent that our economic activity develops. So the presentation on a gross ecosystem product reveals that there's a great potential for applying this in Colombia. And it started back in, in 2003, uh, resolution 1478 was passed and the Ministry of the Environment established a methodology for economic uh, assessment, which is used for uh, uh, market prices and a transfer of benefits, which is a focus that is commonly used today uh, when we, uh, which we use, which we use for environmental impact studies uh, subject to uh, licensing. Well, Colombia is a pioneer country in moving forward in environmental uh, appraisal. Last week, we published uh, an environmental appraisal uh, method that is part of the 1930 Paramo uh, Moore law of recognizing the environmental value of ecosystems for Moors in Colombia. So what, what bottom line, what's important is that we have to move forward in two directions. Now, the first one is to further promote uh, environmental economic assessment, and then how to include different stakeholders given the importance of, uh, in the importance of, of this concept. Uh, it's important to include, for example, ANLA, which is uh, a player in setting cost, uh, price cost, and other government entities uh, and autonomous agencies. For example, the Valle del Cauca Corporation, they've been working since 2015 on uh, ecosystem services values for different uh, watersheds, the Tuluá and Dawa. And they've uh, raised and, and done great uh, efforts at this, including ecosystem health, to see how they optimize investment in conservation and restoration. So the, the large uh, conclusion is that we're on the right path. We just need more events such as this one that uh, will uh, show uh, best practices and then uh, go back and compare this with all the different studies that we have to leverage on the information gathered. Okay, thank you. 
I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Londoño and uh, uh, Mr. Cubillo's questions. How do ecosystem services uh, play a role in public policy decisions or investment uh, at the institutional level or, or at your institution so the government can consider that for their decisions? Uh, Dr. Londoño, thank you. Let me just answer your question uh, with some reflections on uh, the uh, Global Environmental Facility. So this is a metric, sorry, not the Global Environmental Facility, the Gross Ecosystem Product, sorry, GAP. We are subject um, to many uh, ecosystem uh, services. So when we use these metrics for a decision-making process, I think that there are three factors that are imbued in this. One is the change in the different products and services that are rendered. And the other is changes in the market of these service, services and, and products that are rendered and changes in the stock in the state in structure and function. So these three aspects are part of a single metric. So my thoughts have to do with the fact that you need to be able to, if you disaggregate this, these attributes in the metric, it's going to be easier to see where we have to guide our actions. If, for example, the uh, GEP goes up in areas due to the type of of products uh, of services that are rendered or a different market response uh, to the improvement in of ecosystems actions taken are different. But if the GP is going up because the, uh, ser the services and the stocks improve and the uh, services go up, that's a different scenario. So I think that we have to make, find a way to disaggregate this metric and understand it better and communicate it so that co uh, corporations, researchers, the governments can use this uh, in, a, in a clear, uh, or this will be better understood by them and, and they can use it. Uh, and the Humboldt Institute deems this as very important. And it was also mentioned by the speakers that measuring the stock and the structure and function thereof requires much more monitoring within the country. We have data, we've moved forward in that endeavor. Various research institutes have made a great effort at that. And we've uh, now, we now better understand the status of our biodiversity, but we need to increase uh, enforcement and oversight systems of our ecosystem services. And so how could this measure uh, be standardized uh, with regards to how we quantify it, setting up a formula, but to what extent should we measure? Also, the uh, global, OBAN, the Global Observation Network is working at mapping different essential biodiversity variables that need to be measured and thus uh, measure this, these stocks. So it goes beyond to uh, the, the condition of ecosystems and its extension. So we need to simplify what needs to be measured and which is what uh, many of the attendees asked. What do we need to measure to be able to gain this uh, index. So my thoughts now are that. And then uh, we need to, as we said, appraise uh, economically, but comprehensively. And researchers in Colombia have done a great job at this. And Colombia is a pioneer in this type of assessment in a world uh, example of uh, comprehensive assessments. So Santiago started by saying that what we don't uh, assess, we cannot protect that, it's very difficult. But we also have, a, have to understand that 
there are many ways of assessing things, not only biodiversity, and it's not only from an economic perspective. We also have to, uh, well, think a little bit uh, more on that. Uh, thank you. And if you could quickly explain just in a single uh, sentence, what do you mean by comprehensive assessment for the audience members that don't understand uh, this type of methodology? What does that mean? I recommend that, well, that you read about it. Well, comprehensive assessment is uh, what Alexander Rincon has researched. Uh, he works at the National Columbia, National University of Columbia, developed this concept. That means thinking that assessment is not only economic assessment. There are uh, benefits such as human well-being uh, that go beyond uh, what is traditionally measured. So how is this comprehensive assessment made that are not, not only attributes an economic value on something, but that includes uh, well-being? For example, since I'm not an expert in the field, I suggest that you look at research uh, done by Alexander Rincon and their great examples as to how to implement this. Thank you, doctor. Hola, Alejandra, can you hear me? Yes, wonderful. I'd like to uh, thank the UNDP for participating in this important uh, meeting with regards to uh, decision making. I'm an expert on uh, finance and biodiversity. I work at the UNDP but I also work on the uh, development and uh, bioeconomic finances project that is run by the national government. And it's an international uh, initiative that's backed by the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity since 2010, when this uh, need, well, arose of supporting countries in mobilizing resources to strengthen uh, investment having to do with biodiversity management. And with, regarding your question, uh, I'd just like to state to all the attendees that uh, since 2015, the implementation phase and last year, sorry, the formulation phase in 2015 up to 2019, we've included NADCAP uh, through finances and, and uh, it's been part of how we develop policies. So we support the National Planning Department and we also support other stakeholders in policy development, the Minister of the Environment, uh, autonomous regional uh, is, is, uh, governments as well. As a result of the methodology uh, and that's applied in Colombia, there are four large uh, stages that have allowed us include uh, the dimension of NADCAP and how it's necessary in the uh, decision-making process and including institutional stakeholders at a national, territorial, and regional level and promote uh, scenarios where we have more participation and effectively uh, being able to manage biodiversity. So this is one of the uh, initial analyses that uh, we did. Uh, and then we've been working on, uh, well, together with the National Planning Department and the DANE, reviewing public, private, and international uh, cooperation expense uh, and what is spent on conservation of biodiversity. Because if we have a uh, GEP indicator in the future, we need to be able to uh, analyze the uh, fiscal, uh, what, what the what the economic uh, fiscal uh, 
cost is and being able to protect and uh, restore our biodiversity. So that was a part of the second phase. We currently, uh, uh, well, this is published in the UNDP, the efforts that we've made. Uh, our third phase has to do with assessing goals and the ambitions of our national policies with regards to ecosystem services and biodiversity. So this was done together with the Ministry of the Environment in 2016. And the last effort was to identify potential funding sources to help cover, well, that deficit of uh, biodiversity funding. So this is an effort that requires much support. There are many stakeholders. The UNDP is one of them. And then there are many other organizations that have uh, provided support for this process and created uh, investment projects uh, tied to uh, closing the gap. We could speak about this for a longer period of time, but those are five financial solutions that we uh, promote from Biofin, uh, increase in, uh, in uh, donations and carbon sequestration, uh, industrialization, uh, sorry, uh, reform of incentives that have been uh, generated to promote productive services, but that have impact on biodiversity. And this is what we've been supporting and that we're very happy to, well, we'll be happy to share the results once we're ready. Thank you, Byron. We have three more minutes as part of the panel before giving the floor to Santiago. I'm going to just make uh, ask a second round of questions. Very quick answer. From your perspective, what are the next steps that Colombia has to take in uh, environmental accounting? Very short, brief thought. And Diego, you have the floor. Thanks, Alejandra. Mm. Four great steps. We need to involve uh, more high level representatives from government to uh, get their buy in and make more uh, timely decisions on this important uh, topic and thus assign economic resources which we need to be able to uh, obtain results for such a novel uh, topic, DP. We also need to include uh, these topics part of our planning process with a long-term purview. We have our long-term policies, which provide a guideline uh, for developing specific uh, topics, just to name two of them, green growth. We mentioned uh, that already and controlling uh, deforestation and sustainable uh, forest management. And this paves the way for developing uh, other topics. So focus efforts on uh, preparing these plans for future purposes and holding these types of meetings uh, because discussions enrich our uh, knowledge and training and activities that will contribute to providing more knowledge uh, to uh, experts and policymakers and uh, better uh, economic resource management, uh, working with international uh, cooperation agencies or uh, through the planning department internally and obtain those much needed resources for uh, continuing to develop uh, DEP. Okay, thank you, Juan Carlos. Bueno, primeramente es como, como 
Well, I think we need to standardize uh, assessment studies, see the scope of each focus, not just use one single focus. A comprehensive uh, environmental studies, uh, economic uh, studies from an anthropocentric perspective, and ecological, uh, fast ecological appraisals uh, should include both aspects in a multidisciplinary fashion that we need to further explore. So those are, uh, there are also some key items. To promote information uh, among different stakeholders. And if ANLA is requesting studies from all development projects in Colombia, and we want to change that trend of only looking at short-term benefits, as Dr. Aparicio mentioned, then why don't we standardize our assessment studies so that this information, which is enormous and for which we have limited resources in appraising, how can we use that information for DANE, the planning department, and the sustainable development uh, department to use this and focus investment on sustainable development uh, funded by uh, uh, subsidies. So efforts have to be uh, standardized. So we all have the same objective, which is to uh, be the beneficiaries of environmental impact in Colombia. Thank you. Dr. Londoño, um, I agree with what has been said before. We need, we need to hold more discussions among the uh, biological ecosystem community and the economic community because there seems like there's, when we speak about development data, uh, we are each in our own, uh, we're not playing together, we're each uh, in silos. So we need to strengthen our oversight systems. And then uh, I heard, did idam, idam, idam. I need, we need to open this further and include you know, the Humboldt Institute. Uh, many other universities also uh, provide oversight the Colombian Biodiversity Institute as well. So we need to include that uh, broader perspective because it's not all about coverage. There are other aspects that need to be strengthened and it has to be seen from a broader picture and what the different uh, stakeholders are doing and attending and the, the attendees to this meeting. Dr. Andres has said, you know, how about the human footprint? We need to take that into account, yes. Uh, so we need to sit down and think hard. Uh, one more thing, opportunities is a different topic altogether, and perhaps it entails another meeting, but it's how to use the metrics and for what purpose. So enormous opportunity is that this metric, since we're speaking about uh, flows among regions and among countries, if all countries measure this, we could begin to see how the different flows, uh, service flows are measured uh, between more distant, in more distant geographic areas. And that has to do with fair uh, distribution of benefits and common uh, differentiated results that refer to multilateral agreements appropriated in different public policies and and uh, which are not offered operational. I see a great opportunity for uh, this through this index, but that's well the topic of another meeting. Karen? Thanks, Alejandra. Hmm, I'd like to mention uh, various uh, topics such as what Diego mentioned uh, because Diego and myself were colleagues. And that's why we have that, well, similar technical vision. Because I think we need to, uh, we need more political will and institutional will 
to be able to assess the damage already done. So we need to acknowledge that we need this information because a lot of information is being gathered that is the result of a specific idea uh, of, of needing the information. But once you get the information, then that interest in the information is lost. So when we present the results, clearly uh, there's no longer any interest. Projects are then uh, shortened. So first, we need to uh, do an inventory of our information, but it's not only financial information, but statistical, geographic, and scientific information as well. And uh, I'm going to mention what Maria Cecilia mentioned, uh, including the research institutions, uh, Humboldt, IDEAM, Abemar, all the different uh, institutions that uh, research and, and generate information and put that under a single framework and thus identify uh, the information that's available and uh, look at the uh, cross-reference the information that we have and the demand and the uh, core GP purposes, and then do a diagnosis and assessment of the quality of the information. What that diagnosis allows is to uh, come up with more coherent items uh, when we are, look for our GPP. And an essential stakeholder that can be part of the uh, information gathering phase is academia. Academia must actively participate through its research institutes, but through these in these processes to be able to fill the gaps of information. We, yes, uh, we need more uh, financial resources, but I think academia can also help us with that. Uh, they also uh, are post grads. Uh, they could all work on attaining funding and also establish institutional technical cooperation mechanisms. So the same people won't always be talking to each other and uh, convey the mission of that we, we have set forth here. Dana, of course, is part of this, but the IDEAM is head of, of reporting on environmental information. So I think we have to really uh, include a mix of stakeholders to provide uh, data that's uh, trustworthy and uh, scientifically founded and uh, supported by our institutions. Uh, see here, this is the process that is going to be new, although it's been applied to different countries, in different countries. National accounts have existed since 2017, and this is a longer process. So working with what we have, uh, along with uh, gathering more information, uh, to be able to also learn from others through best practices. Thank you for your uh, quest for your responses, panelists. I'm glad to hear that this was a good workshop uh, because we included different types of stakeholders and you had the opportunity to uh, ask your questions. So different research institutes should be included. And I do agree with you, uh, Byron, academia plays an important role especially uh, since, well, Stanford is, is leading this presentation precisely uh, from the academic perspective. So I'm going to give the floor to Santiago Aparicio to close, uh, to just give some final, final remarks and then uh, some closing remarks from Dr. Mandel. Uh, so thank you attendees and thanks Lori and uh, I uh, myself for the interpretation. It's my, been my pleasure. It, this has been definitely a feat in uh, coordination among countries, among languages. And uh, thank you. Thank you. The floor. Thank you. Definitely everything that has been said is truly uh, valuable, interesting, especially the panel. It gives you much food for thought. So thank you, uh, Stanford University, 
in the Chinese Academy of Sciences for organizing uh, well this meeting. As Brian mentioned, we've uh, been working on this since the uh, 70s, but knowledge is never uh, something that we do not need. So thank you so much for this meeting and providing the state of the art in this novel topic. I'd like to mention something important and it's, well, after hearing all the thoughts and the status of this topic in Colombia, and since we've been addressing this for years, there are two challenges that we face. One has to do with uh, the technical side, the scientific side, that we have to uh, provide enough scientific rigor, but also from uh, not only the scientific uh, technical perspective, but the uh, policies and creating public policies, political side and uh, economy of behavioral economies. How can we uh, convert this into tangible results? I mentioned this at the beginning, but I think the way to start doing this, as Dana mentioned, is to use a precise and current tools that already exist. Uh, So everything that the environmental information system has already. So we need to continue to move forward in consolidating NADCAP and ecosystem services and calculate uh, our GP, hopefully as a result. In parallel to that, to be very much aware and precise that it's easy uh, with regards to innovation, that there could always be, uh, there could always be something better. And we don't want to be the cat that's trying to catch its tail. We have to find uh, just areas that we can adopt through two or three pilots. But that's the challenge. How do we find that specific example uh, the uh, presentation by China showed us concrete examples. So I need, we need to do that, find those entry points. Many times it's easy to speak and, and not reach a uh, conclusion. And I was saying that in an internal meeting the other day. Sometimes we uh, take so long trying to, to reach perfection that uh, it, sometimes it's too late by the time we know what to do. The NADCAP that we're trying to uh, preserve and conserve is already uh, lost. Uh, we don't want that. That's what we fear. So we have to be a little bit daring and uh, not so much write things in, in, in uh, stone, but think that this is an iterative process that's going to be dynamic and changing and growing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Director Aparicio, for sharing those thoughts. Um, my name is Lisa Mandel. I'm a lead scientist with a natural capital project and wanted to um, share some closing remarks from, from our side. I wanted to start off by thanking our, all the speakers and panelists who shared their expertise and insights and vision for uh, enabling people and nature to thrive together in Colombia. Um, I think we've seen from the example in China how GEP can be a practical approach for measuring and valuing natural capital in a way that supports decision-making from planning to policy to finance. And we've seen that Columbia is really a pioneer in these efforts and a leader as well, um, but not going alone in, in this, these efforts. Um, GEP has been 
approved by UNCA and a number of other countries are also starting to embark on this, this effort. Um, and I think there's real power in being able to um, go together uh, in this journey, as Mary said at the beginning. Um, and we've heard from the fantastic panel um, of experts from Colombia as well, how GEP can, can build on and even bring together longstanding efforts in Colombia um, that are already very well advanced in terms of different approaches um, and data uh, and, and existing policies. So um, I and the, the rest of the Natural Capital Project, we've had the pleasure of working with Director uh, Aparicio and his team over the past year. And we're really excited to continue to collaborate uh, with DNP and others in Colombia as uh, you take the next steps towards um, advancing these efforts and, and uh, embarking on a new, new directions and intangible change. Um, I wanted to remind everybody, oh, let me show my slide here, that, um, let's see. I want to remind everybody that this webinar will be available on the Natural Capital Project's YouTube channel over the next few days. And we will also be sharing a PDF of the slides um, to the email address with which you registered. So you can look forward to receiving that in the next couple of days. And finally, I wanted to um, thank everybody who made this webinar possible behind the scenes, especially Thais and, and Lori. Um, and especially thank all the participants who have spent the past two hours with us um, and joined in with really great questions and discussion. So please um, enjoy the rest of your day and uh, look forward to continuing this conversation with all of you. Thank you. Muchas gracias a todos. Muchas gracias por la invitación. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Hasta luego. Chao. Estén muy bien. Gracias. Hasta luego. Hasta luego. Gracias.